Okay, our friend Dean Burnett, the science writer for The Guardian, says, I once spoke with someone who said that he didn't believe in evolution. When I asked him why, his main argument was that people don't have wings. While this is definitely the case, I asked how this relates to evolution. His response was that evolution is survival of the fittest, and wings are the best. So there is that. I don't know how much research this person had done to arrive at his conclusion, so I'm just putting it in here in case. Today, folks, we talk about evolution. Uh, how that idea has uh, developed historically, where we are today, and then how that idea has trickled into anthropology, social ecology, and then eventually how the idea of evolution has been misused, perhaps, and controversies around it. Did everybody get to the readings? They were pretty short. Granted, we had to read chapter two of the textbook, which was uh, a little longer, but we also had a couple of nice, short, popular pieces. The newspaper article about Jamaican sprinters. People read that? Yeah, that one was quite fun, I thought. Well done. And, and 700 words long or something. Uh, what anthropologists need to know about the new evolutionary synthesis. Uh, and then a, a nice brief article, the Call, writing about new ideas about our relationship with the environment how climate change might have operated in the past. Shall we dive in? All righty. So last week, our essential business was that we talked about people living in places, encountering challenges, and responding to them. If you can grasp that sort of fundamental concept, that's half the battle finished. People, importantly, can be individuals or they can be populations. That sounds like a simple distinction, but it has some major implications for how we think about processes in this class. Those places that they live, we tend to analyze them in this course as ecosystems. Right? That's special. That's a unit of measure that matters. And those ecosystems have three key components, matter, energy, and information. Right? And it's information that makes possible feedback, which can drive you know, positive or negative feedback and drive change or regression in response to stress. Those stresses that we get from the environment can take many different forms. And that the response, well, I mean, one response I suppose to stress is simply to die, right? Not to respond at all. That would be an unsuccessful response. A successful response is usually in the form of either adaptation or adjustment. When we talk about adaptation, we're talking about population level changes in gene frequencies. What we might sort of describe today as being a cousin with evolution. Adaptation, shorter term, right? often reversible. We have developmental, regulatory, and acclimatory adjustments that help us to compensate for specific challenges in the short term, all right? without necessarily affecting genetic structure. There's a tricky sort of asterisk on the end of that that we're going to talk about today, an exciting new research that might change how we think about, about uh, adjustment processes in genetics. And then lastly, the way that humans respond to these environmental challenges are special. They're different. As far as we know, they're unique. We can respond through physiological, genetic processes, but those are slow, they're costly, they're inefficient. We can also respond through culture. And that's so cool. That's what makes us so different. We can put on a jacket when we're cold instead of growing fur, right? And taking a thousand generations to do it. You can put on a jacket in 30 seconds. And now you've adjusted, right, to the challenge. So we call this the process of dual inheritance. All of us are born with a set of genetic information, a genotype, right? But we also uh, are born into a culture that has a, a set of beliefs, that has a language, that has a set of technologies and material technologies that we use to mitigate the effects of our environment, to interact with our environment, to exploit our environment. And that's different, right? That makes us special. So understanding evolutionary processes and ecological processes in this class, we think, requires understanding both of those factors, the physiological and the cultural. So today, the evolution of ecology, that's a cute title for a saying that we're going to try and talk about how historically we've understood the relationships between organisms and their environments with a special focus on human beings. Today, we're going to be talking a bit about these developments and a bit about where we stand today, what our current state of the art is, we'll end by talking about some new developments. So first, evolution as an idea, how it's developed over time, how it's evolved. 
a survey of ecological anthropology, so how evolutionary ideas have, have developed in anthropology, in the study of human societies instead of the study of fruit flies or mice or birds. Lastly, some discussion of new developments and then some uh, developments and then some controversies and problems that I hope we'll be able to get a good discussion out of. All right. First, evolution. Hands up if you've heard of evolution. Outstanding. You're in the right classroom. What is evolution? Let's define evolution as changes in the hereditary makeup of a population over time. This is changes over time. Slightly different from our definition of adaptation, right? You remember that adaptation was about changes that confer a reproductive benefit in a given environment, right? Population level. So we're thinking of evolution slightly differently from adaptation and adjustment. It's a nuanced distinction, and we'll get into the reasons why that is in, in the next uh, few minutes. But remember from last week, we talk about different ways of responding to challenges in an environment. Adjustment is easy, it's fast, and it's generally pretty cheap, right? Regulatory adjustments especially, that is the cultural ones, rules about behavior, about dress, about manners, those are probably the easiest of all, the fastest of all. We hold them very dear to ourselves, right? But they're quite simple from the biological point of view. As opposed to evolution and adaptation, which require big, long time frames, right? And population level changes. So let's start with the idea of, of the history of evolution, where the idea came from. People have, for a very long time, tried to explain variation. Between human beings, between living things, human beings especially have always been an interesting question mark. The ancient Greeks, decided that the explanation was down to geography. Remember, at the height of their powers, the Greek Empire, massively widespread, very wealthy, very advanced in terms of their arts, their government, and so on. And the Greeks thought, yeah, the reason that we're so much better than everyone else is because we live here in Greece, which is the right spot to live. We occupy the middle latitudes. I mean, Mediterranean Sea, who here speaks Latin, what is the Mediterranean? It's the middle of the earth, exactly. Yeah, and the Greeks believed the weather here is the best, the food here is the best. Because we have this key strategic place in the Aegean Mediterranean Sea, we can exploit our sea power, right? To project military might, political might. So the Greeks thought, yeah, because we live here, we've ended up being far more successful than everyone else. This environment is the perfect one for the kind of society that we want to have. They also thought that living in the tropics would make you lazy, make you idle. The middle latitudes were best because they had the right balance of the four elements, right? Earth, water, wind, and fire. The Romans sort of developed this idea. We're talking now about classical Romans, not sort of going on Italy on holidays next week or something. Uh, same idea. They thought that Rome instead of Greece was the perfect place to live and that's why they were such a successful society. The Roman Empire, again, vast, very, very powerful at its height. And the Romans thought, you know, the reason that we're so well off is because we live in Rome. And Rome is the perfect environment for the development of human civilization. They extended this to start applying some of these environmental theories to other people. So the reason that people over there are like this is because of their culture. One example, they thought that the Germanic tribes, the people from the north, were strong but lazy, disorganized. If anybody's been to Germany recently and been to Italy recently, you'll see the irony in that. <laughs> Germany, Germany is many things, but it's not disorganized, right? Uh, and so they, they thought, again, this idea of living in the correct band of latitude was going to allow you to develop differently and better than others. In classical Arabic culture, we're talking about antiquity here again. In Arab antiquity, there were two sort of sets of ideas about what influenced human development, human behavior. One was cosmological or astrological, uh, what we would call sort of horoscopes, essentially, today. What, what uh, dominates human development? Well, your, your stars, right? 
If the sun and the moon and the stars are sort of smiling upon you, then you'll develop nicely. So there was that sort of stream of thought. There was a second that took very seriously this question of geography, especially what we would now call zoning, essentially. In other words, where's the best place to build a city? How close should a city be to water? Does having certain types of vegetation around you make your city more successful? Make the people there more mild-mannered or happy or healthy? And this is getting into some very modern ideas. But the presence of, let's say, malarial parasites near stagnant water, things like that. Right. The Arabs took this a step further by applying some of their ideas about geography and location to their own medical beliefs right, about human health, wellness. The Arabs applied to a humoral system. They adhered to a humoral system. The body has four humors, which correspond with the, world, the, the four elements, right? And that those four humors have to be in balance in order for you to be healthy. And that those humors will respond to your environment in ways that are better or worse for your health, your development. It will govern your behavior. And unsurprisingly, most uh, scholars in Arab antiquity said, yes, where we're living right here is the best place. That's why we're so advanced. And again, in antiquity Arabic culture, miles ahead of many of their neighbors in uh, certain fields of endeavor, and they looked upon themselves as being quite serene, quite developed. And it was because of where they lived. Right? And then finally, into Renaissance Europe, and uh, let's say even toward Enlightenment Europe, these questions get refined a little bit. The Renaissance is an exciting period for Western Europe. New spirit of inquiry, right? Empirical science, discovery. People are moving out of the local and into the global. What starts happening during the Renaissance is that European explorers are getting out and encountering new peoples who are very different from them. Different languages, different physiology, different anatomy, different beliefs. And they start seeking explanations to that. I might suggest, in a certain sense, this is the beginning of anthropology. Missionaries, soldiers, explorers, going off, encountering new people, finding them fascinating and exciting, writing stories about them, books about them, and then coming home and sharing those with the people back home. There was an exploitive and destructive side to that, which we'll talk about at great length in this class. But to a certain extent, this is where we start really taking seriously the idea of cataloging and, and maybe hoping to explain differences between peoples all over the world. Um, and I'm friendly towards the Renaissance folks. I think they did good work. They were keen on being a bit more sophisticated. They rejected some of the Greek and, and Roman ideas about geography being exclusive and instead started to embrace the idea that maybe culture gives us some means of buffering our environment. Culture can be a tool to respond to where you live. Right? So it's not purely your environment, but it's a dialogue between your culture and your environment. That was a nice step forward, I think. And then we took two great big steps back, ironically, in the 18th century, um, back in towards sort of this question of, of latitude. Uh, people have heard of Baron Montesquieu? No? great uh, thinker, polymath of the French Enlightenment, who when he started thinking hard about human development, human variation, and geography said, well obviously the best place in the world to live is France. <laughs> Humans are uniquely adapted to thrive in France. And everywhere else that people live, they're doing badly because you know, they're not living here in Paris like the rest of us. Sort of represents a 2,000 year leap backward to some of these ideas, considering uh, that they got so many things right during the Enlightenment. But we see the beginning of some important ideas here, right? One of which I, I would call sort of an inherent bias, right? Or ethnocentrism. We're familiar with the term ethnocentrism. When something is ethnocentric, it is focused on or centered on its own ethnicity, right? So 
takes for granted the, the truthness or the fundamentalness of one particular ethnicity, all of these theorists are guilty of that, right? Invariably, we see that the ego, the self, is the standard against which everybody else is measured. Montesquieu seems disappointed that people who live in Peru or something don't live like French people do and decides that that must be because they're doing it wrong, right? Rather than having you know, a separate but parallel track of environmental dialogue. So first we get this idea. The ego is always the self. Number two, we get these questions about the present always being the best. The way that we live here right now is the standard against which everything else should be measured. And so that's where we started to develop questions like, gosh, I wonder why their skin is black instead of white. Right. Rather than asking the reverse, which seems the more natural question, pale skin's very narrowly distributed around the world. Why not ask, how come we're white instead of being dark like everyone else? So the ego becomes the center of investigation into these questions, right? And your current environment, uh, ecologically and culturally, becomes the ethnocentric yardstick against which you measure everybody else and usually decide that they're not as good as you are. This was how we started trying to answer these questions. Into the 19th and 20th centuries, progress, finally. We begin with a guy called Friedrich Ratzel. Uh, he was a German ethnographer, very interested in culture and cultural differences, also just a general polymath. He knew a lot about a lot of things. He died in 1904, so he's working in sort of the late 1800s, end of the 20th century. Ratzel's main idea was habitat. If you're going to sum him up in one word, he said that habitat is where diversity comes from. That on some fundamental level, maybe all human beings are the same organism, but when you place them in different environments, they change, right? They react in dialogue with their environments. If that were just the case, then you would never get culture change, though. Especially in the late uh, 1800s, we don't really have sophisticated ideas about climate change, paleoecology. So how do you explain that culture changes? Surely we don't just adapt once to our environment and then stay that way forever. Yes? What does he mean by habitat? Habitat as the environment in which uh, a human being lives. Cultural and geographical environment where a human lives as being the key source of diversity. Habitat is what makes human variation happen. All right? And he says... Culture change gets caused by migration. That's what makes people different. That's what makes variation uh, spread and diffuse. Cultural diffusion and physiological diffusion happens when people move from one place to another. So you're born here and you become uniquely shaped by this environment and then one day you walk up and move a thousand miles away, start a new family and then that's where we introduce change. People from one habitat get into conflict with each other. They have wars, they have ecological crises or whatever, and then they move somewhere else, and that spreads the great sort of variety around the world that we see today. He still had some of these hang-ups about environments producing certain types of people that strike us today as being a bit racist. He was convinced that, for instance, people in the mountains, they're quite stable. Right? The societies there are nice and even keeled, whereas people in the tropics, they're lazy. Right? So it's not hard to see where some of these are going, some of these ideas, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But he's starting to at least try to formalize a big picture theory about how humans end up the way they look today. We then move on to Thomas Malthus. I'm sure people have heard of Malthus. Yes? All right. He's one of these guys who's uh, so influential that he's been turned into an adjective. His ideas are Malthusian. You'll hear that used often when we talk about things like population. Increasingly, climate change involves discussions of Malthusianism. Malthus is uh, another German. He begins by working on some mathematical problems. He's a brilliant mathematician. 
But he's not interested in pure math. He's interested in applied mathematics and especially biological problems. He begins with this theory that Justice Liebig had come up with called the law of the minimum. Liebig said if you look at a petri dish or if you look at a garden full of roses or whatever, organisms will keep multiplying until they are limited by the factor that is in least supply. So the law of the minimum says whatever factor is in least supply is the limiter for the organisms in that system. Right. If you don't have enough water, you're going to reproduce right up until the point that there's not enough water to go around, right. and then you'll have to stop. Farmers do this all the time when they analyze soil chemistry. Right? We've got enough of everything except nitrogen, damn it. We have to add more nitrogen to the soil. That factor is the one that is causing limited growth. Right? Single factor. Malthus takes this a step further and says, what about human beings? Do they behave like this? He comes up with the notion that all organisms want to increase, not just as much as they can, but exponentially. Geometric growth. Right? and that they will keep growing exponentially until they exceed the carrying capacity of their environment. Carrying capacity is uh, Malthus's sort of key development, his key contribution. So he takes Liebig's law of the minimum, he thinks about it in cybernetic ways, right? How would the law of the minimum apply in an ecosystem where everything is connected, right? In the case of human beings, they're going to keep exponentially increasing, but human beings need food. That means that we need farmland, number one, and number two, we need uh, grazing, let's say, for our animals. So in the case of a human culture, then perhaps the limiter on our exponential growth is how many acres of grass we have. If we run out of space for the cows to eat grass, then we don't have enough cows to eat, and then people start getting hungry. Malthus says when you exceed that carrying capacity, the system has to correct itself. Right? You can't stay above that artificially for very long. You will either have war, or famine, or starvation, or disease, but you will fall back to the carrying capacity of the system. It's sort of uh, the nature of organisms that they will keep trying to increase, and in human beings that's especially the case. Having sex feels good. Reproduction is rewarding. Right? But all of our ecosystems have caps on them. This is Malthus's big idea. Where he's run into problems since is that it turns out carrying capacities might not be fixed. Right? The amount of grain that you can grow on one acre of land has changed dramatically over the past century. The Green Revolution allowed us to really increase our yields right? by adding fertilizer, by adding more energy to these problems, using mechanical plows instead of horse-drawn plows. You can get much more food out of the same amount. So all that has the effect of doing is increasing the carrying capacity. And people using Malthusian mathematics have predicted the end of the world many, many times over the past many, many years. And they keep saying, wait, 1972 is going to be the year that we cross that magic number. And then they'll, we'll be over the carrying capacity and we'll just have to start dying off. And every time those predictions end up being wrong, because at least so far, we've been able to increase the carrying capacity. Right? Human population still grows exponentially, but so far at least, carrying capacity is proven to be plastic. That might not indefinitely be the case. Right? So at some point we believe we will run up against the limits of this system. But for now, that's been the one problem with predictions based on Malthusian theories. So, from Malthus we move on to Lamarck. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, French guy, very interesting fellow, was a soldier started getting really into science when he retired in Monte Carlo. Decided to drop out of the army and study plants and animals and things. Lamarck was interested in the question of inheritance. Now we're really getting somewhere, right? Now we're getting into the juicy evolutionary stuff. Lamarck was probably the first guy to come up with a coherent, solid theory of how inheritance happens and thereby how animals change from one form to another. Lamarck gets a bit of a bad rap, and he sometimes gets lumped in with Darwin, so we're going to make a careful distinction between those two right now. 
Lamarck's idea was what's called soft inheritance, Lamarckian inheritance. That is the idea that an organism passes on characteristics that it acquires during its lifetime to its offspring. So the idea that an organism acquires characteristics during its own lifetime and then when it reproduces gives those characteristics to its young. Those of you that are thinking ahead to Darwin, this is not Darwin's idea. Darwin's much more about genetics, thanks to our friend Mendel. But Lamarck's idea was a, a serious attempt to draw together a theory with a handful of rules that might explain why people with this type of hair have children with that type of hair or something. The best example that we know of for illustrating Lamarck's theory is the giraffe. So if you're thinking of Lamarckianism, soft inheritance, why do giraffes have long necks? You're thinking like Darwin. Giraffes have long necks because they keep stretching. Right? They keep trying to reach the very best leaves. Right? And if you stretch really hard, maybe your neck will get an inch longer. And then when you have children, they will have slightly longer necks too, just like yours. And then if they work really hard to reach the highest branch, they will also have longer necked children. They'll take the extra inch and add one more of their own, right? <laughs> this sounds a bit silly, but Lamarck is doing this in an era before genetics. In fact, before Mendel's theories of inheritance. So he's coming up with an idea about how traits get passed on. And there is a certain common sense rationality to this. Yeah, gosh, if you were a really good runner and you ran really hard all the time and exercised a lot, maybe when you had kids, they'd be good runners too. Hmm. Yes? Kind of right in the sense of epigenetics? Yes, which is the last slide we're going to talk about. Yeah, so before we throw Lamarck out and dismiss him as being totally crazy, it's important to say that He's coming back into vogue for a series of reasons that are absolutely mind-bending, and I can't wait to talk about those, because it's a, a hugely exciting field right now. Lastly, we'll talk about Gregor Mendel. He was a German-speaking monk. He was born in, in Silesia, a country that no longer exists, but we could cost, call him German. How about that? A monk who spent a lot of time hanging out in the monastery. Monks brew a lot of beer, right? The Christian monks do, and they garden. You know, they keep beans and they keep chickens and things. Mendel was, a, a, again, like some of these others, a remarkably intelligent guy, self-educated in some ways, who was also very, very good at math. He also liked gardening, grew a lot of beans. And like every farmer since the beginning of time, <laughs> he started to realize, boy, you know, if you cross this plant with that plant, or this animal with that animal, you'll end up with a certain type of offspring, right? And that you can start selecting, actually, for the traits that you want. If you want red peppers instead of green peppers, and this plant is more likely to give you red than green, then you can start selectively breeding that plant and bring out the traits that you want. But nobody had ever really tried to systematize these ideas of inheritance. Mendel's the first. So, he starts breeding his peas and making uh, empirical studies of which traits get passed on from P, which P parent to which P child and starts coming up with a handful of key ideas. We're not going to get bogged down in them, but his three main ideas were number one, the traits are passed on independently. So I mean it's possible to have your mom's hair in your, your dad's eyes. And then his other main idea, right, let, let's do two. First, <laughs> the traits can be passed on independently. Right? So unlike Lamarck, in which the entire organism basically maps onto its offspring, Mendel is saying, no, there are a whole bunch of factors. He describes them as factors. Today we call them genes. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of factors. That you can take some and leave the others. So if your mom has red hair, you might or you might not. You could get her eyes but not her hair, for instance. So there seems to be more at play than just a simple reproduction. There's a picking and choosing of these factors. And then number two, there seems to be some sort of pattern of dominance and recession. This is where the idea of dominant and recessive traits comes from. Thank you, Mr. Mendel. 
He gave us the idea that some traits can skip a generation, right? That some traits tend to overwhelm others. Brown hair is dominant, blonde hair is recessive, and so on. So Mendel really changes how we think about this. For all of his efforts, he was sort of lost. This was very controversial work at the time, and his work was sort of buried for decades. When people started to rediscover it, they realized he was really onto something. Obviously, his ideas start to replace those of Lamarck for now, though, tricky to say how exactly. After that, Uncle Charles, our friend. Uh, this is one of my very, very favorite pictures. This is a page from one of his notebooks. If you can read this, I don't know, it's a bit blurry. He's sort of jotting down in his notebook, I think. And he draws sort of the entire tree of evolution. This is sort of an idea that Darwin came up with one day. You know, here's a thought, he says. Maybe everything evolves. We take his ideas now for granted so much that it's hard to understand how absolutely revolutionary this was. And, at the same time, how really simple Darwin's theory of evolution by way of natural selection is when we boil it down to the key principles. All right? So, things about Charles Darwin. He's an animal nut, really into birds. Did a whole bunch of research on mussels, like not flexing mussels, but like mollusks. That was how he sort of cut his teeth as a scientist, studying differences in mussels on the shorelines of England. Fathered whole piles of children. He had a huge family, which is interesting for a man who's an evolutionist, right? He also took part in a handful of these huge scientific expeditions, right, where he got on a boat and sailed to all corners of the world for years at a time. When he went on his first big journey, he brought a couple of books with him. Number one, he read a lot of Malthus, right? He was influenced by our friend Malthus. His ideas of carrying capacity, exponential growth. Right? The other thing that he read a ton of was geology. So, I think the key to understanding Charles Darwin is understanding the twin sort of pressures of variation and time. Darwin starts reading geology and starts discovering, wow, the Earth is way older than we thought. He had ideas in his head about how evolution might have happened, but it was really hard to reconcile them with the biblical idea that the Earth was 6,000 years old or 10,000 years old, which at the time was the paradigm that people were working under in England. He starts reading some geologists who are doing interesting research on how old the world might be based on erosion patterns, things like this. And this absolutely opens his mind. He said, hey, if the time frames are long enough, I can see the possibility for other explanation. Maybe I can start applying these geological time frames to problems in biology. Right? So this is where the light bulb starts to go on for Charles Darwin. What he wants to know, why do we have species on Earth? This is his big theory, his big question, I should say. Speciation. Remember last week we talked about the definition of an individual. What is an individual? This is a single representative of, of a species. Why is that important? Why do you have to be a representative of a species? One more time? So that you can reproduce. Yeah. Species, members of a species can only have viable offspring with other members of the same species. Right? That's why a dog and a cat can't have children together. Babies, they don't have children, do they? Uh, pups, kits, kittens? Uh, because they're members of different species. This is a very simple biological law that, again, farmers have known for thousands of years. But then it begs the question, if two different species can't reproduce and have viable offspring, where do new species come from? Were all of them created at once at the beginning of time? Or is there some mechanism by which new species can arise. Can't be by reproduction, right, between two different animals. So there has to be some sort of mechanism that creates new species. Remember the title of Darwin's greatest work is The Origin of Species. Yeah, he didn't write a book about 
the beginning of the world or evolution or something, he, his fundamental problem is where do species come from? And he says, here's where species come from. A process called evolution by way of natural selection. He drew that picture of the tree. This was his bold idea. He said, all life on Earth is related in some kind of way. And if you can stretch out this time scale for millions of years, then it's long enough. You start with central branches, and then you start to branch off. Right? New species arise, not through reproduction, but through processes of evolutionary change. Through speciation by way of evolution caused by natural selection. So, what is evolution by natural selection? Four points. Really, if you, if you boil this down to its simplest. Number one, things reproduce, right? Living things reproduce. Do we agree with that? Yes. Unless those living things clone themselves, then they vary when they reproduce. Right? Offspring are always at least a little bit different from their parents. So variation gets introduced when things reproduce. Some of those variations will be beneficial in a given environment at a given time. And in doing so, they will confer fitness, right? Fitness, reproductive success. Right? Those variations that increase fitness will therefore become more frequent. So when Darwin says survival of the fittest, he's not talking about the survival of the animal with the biggest muscles or the sharpest teeth. He's talking about survival of those organisms that have variations that give you an adaptive benefit in a specific environment at a specific time. Right? If this process happens and keeps happening millions of times for millions of years, then organisms can fundamentally change. Not just change color or shape, but change species. Right? And the tree starts to branch out. That's Darwin's evolutionary theory in a nutshell. He was a remarkably rigorous guy, very modest, right? gathered piles of data and was very careful about how he expressed his theories. Um, and he's been misused quite a lot, right? We think that Darwin meant a lot of things that he didn't mean. He never spoke about the origin of life. He never talked about which stages of development were better than others or something. But rather that evolution is a process where you take a dozen eggs and you throw them against the wall. All right? The egg that doesn't break, that's the winner. It has children, right? And its children take on some of its traits by way of genetic succession. And you repeat that millions and millions and millions of times. Variation and time. That's Darwin in a nutshell. Good? All right. Now, this theory obviously very controversial. What a lot of people didn't like about evolution is that it's heartless. There's no engine here, right? There's no big meaning to it all. We just keep randomly varying and seeing what works. We keep throwing those eggs against the wall and hoping that something's going to stick. And this clashes with people's idea that there must be some sort of grand design, that some people are chosen and some people are not. Something like that. So, even though Darwin presents us with a really coherent, really useful, really successful theory, it still comes under a lot of criticism. Where are we today? Well, essentially we still live in a Darwinian world. Any physics students here? You guys are familiar with Newton's physics, right? Yeah, F equals MA? Yeah, all right. A lot of Newton's key theories, a lot of Newton's understandings about how the universe worked were supplanted by people like Einstein, who told us we live in a, a relative universe, not a clockwork universe. And then later, by quantum theory. But Newton still works. We still use him, right? It's basic Newtonian physics that lets airplanes fly and cars drive and things. And so by way of metaphor, we might say the same thing about Darwin. A lot of his ideas have been refined and changed. Some of them have been thrown out altogether. But the big picture, variation, right, time, those are still in place. We still use Darwin's theories today, 
it's still a really powerful tool for understanding how people come to be different, how organisms respond to their environment. All right? In sum, where evolutionary theory stands at the moment, you could give it, let's say, four bullet points. <laughs> Here's what we believe. Number one, all populations vary. Two possible ways, though. You can vary by way of random mutation, which was what Darwin had in mind. You can also vary by way of recombination, right, by way of certain mutations coming back and meeting others in the reproductive process. Right. Number two, all populations want to increase. Thank you to our friend Thomas Malthus, yes. All populations want to increase exponentially to the limits of their environmental constraints. These days, we take that for granted. Experimentally, this is very easy to do now with microscopes in a petri dish, right? Start a culture and watch it grow until it fills up the dish or it eats all the, uh, the saline that you have available for it or whatever. Number three, the best adapted phenotypes will be selected for under a given environment. And then lastly, the effect of the environment on genotypes is indirect. So that's what we break, for instance, with Lamarck. The giraffe does not have a long neck because it tried to stretch its neck out, thereby developing long neck genes and passing those on to its children. Not how it works, right? The environment doesn't act at that level on genetics. Again, this has been complicated very recently in ways that are endlessly fascinating, so we'll talk about that at the end. In terms of other sort of themes that are emerging now, we're starting to appreciate just how slow evolution is, and that it might also operate in what we would call punctuated equilibrium. So we can have long periods of fairly stable evolutionary development punctuated by very quick ones. Lactase persistence for digesting dairy is one. High altitude adaptations that we'll talk about in two weeks' time are another that have come up apparently very recently. Right? So our idea of time scales is shifting, as is our notion of evolution as a process. You don't just evolve and then be finished with it. You're never perfectly adapted to your environment. Right? You are always mutating. The environment around you is always changing. And different qualities are more suited to certain challenges at certain times. So we're increasingly thinking of evolution as a process instead of just a ladder that you reach the top of and then pat yourself on the back. We're coming to understand the multifactorial processes involved in selection. We tend to imagine natural selection as a process where the lion is chasing the zebras and he kills the one who's the slowest. Right? And then the slow lion, or sorry, the slow zebra doesn't get to pass on its genes to its children. We're also learning that there are a lot of other things at play. It's not just about predator selection, it's also about sexual selection, right? Sometimes who gets to mate is who has the most success on the dance floor, right? Kin selection, also sex ratio maintenance. So there are sometimes lengths to which we go in reproduction to maintain a balance of male versus female that might be artificial, and that's going to shape right, how genetic material gets passed on. And then lastly, survival of the fittest and increasing fitness is not a zero-sum game. It always comes at a cost, right? So growing those extra huge muscles costs you a ton of energy. And that cost of gathering more food, eating all the time, it has to be enough to offset right, the, the, the fitness benefit. So you need to have a cost-benefit equation when you think about adaptation. And that sometimes adapting to specific environmental problems comes at a cost that's too great right, in order to get passed on. OK, that's where we are today. Now let's talk about ecological anthropology. This is what we all do in this class, right? So now we're going to do a quick survey of four different key thinkers in anthropology who have applied some of these human environment ideas to understand problems of social anthropology. We're going to start with our friend Julian Stewart. That's him on the right. 
The uh, man on the left, I think, is a Shoshone elder from the Western United States. And that's the people among whom Stewart did a lot of his research. Uh, American anthropologist, he was born in California, raised during the Depression, and grew up during the Depression. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind when you imagine his perspectives and his work. Very much an empirical scientist. Really loved evidence. This makes him fundamentally different from Franz Boas, who's probably the sort of leading light in American anthropology at that time. Boas very interested in symbolic cultural anthropology, right? In ritual, kinship structures, things like that. Stewart is much more interested in being a scientist. He's working with the Shoshone people and a few other, uh, let's say, hot weather desert uh, tribes in the southern and western United States. And he starts to advance an idea that he calls cultural ecology. And at the time, this is bold stuff. It's not been tried. He says, there must be some material explanations for culture. Right. Causal explanations for culture. In other words, he says that culture change, when you adapt, let's say, a certain type of wedding ceremony or funeral practices or linguistic habits, that that's driven by your environment. Culture is a response to environment. This is quite a bold break right, for anthropology at this time. To him, the environment is central. And that is why, he says, this is why people look different all around the world. Processes of parallel adaptation. If you plunk a group of people in this desert and a plunk another group of people in that desert and they never get to meet one another, they will both adapt to their environment. And their social structures will be a response to their environment, though they might be different. He said you can still find the explanation in the environment. His three keys of analysis, the way that Stewart looked at problems, the reason why he's still important to us today. He said, if you want to understand a culture, here's what you look at. Number one, their natural resources and the tools that they use to exploit them. When you step off the airplane or out of your truck or whatever, that's the first thing you do. Take me to your mines, take me to your fields, right, or to your sugar caves. And you examine the tools that people use to exploit those resources. Number two, you ask how the division of labor and the organization of the economy works. So when you gather those resources, who gets them? Do you pay taxes? Do you distribute everything equally? Is there a king who decides or something? Do we have differences, for instance, in male and female gender roles about work? Do women do one kind of work and men do another or something? And then number three, what is the influence of these first two things on other social structures. Can we see echoes of these things in religion, in kinship, marriage, and death? Obviously, it's going to be easiest to apply Stewart's model to small subsistence economies, right? Nobody in this room currently is carrying any tools to exploit natural resources, are they? like a pocket knife or a shovel or <laughs> right. an oil drilling rig. You know. At some point, I think complex societies start to get divorced from their subsistence. Right? However, this approach, fundamental. Our next is Roy Rappaport, really interesting guy. He brings us into the age of what we would call ecological anthropology. Steward, more of a cultural ecologist, Rappaport, an ecological anthropologist. These are titles. They both shared similar interests. They just took a slightly different approach. Rappaport was more scientifically rigorous still, had serious training in biology and ecology. And when he went in to do anthropological research, he was interested in applying that perspective. Major milestone for him was a book that he wrote in 1968 called Pigs for the Ancestors. This is Rappaport's approach. He's working in Papua New Guinea, among a tribe called the Sembaga, late 1960s. And he said, let's study populations instead of cultures. Let's think of this place as an ecosystem instead of a tribe who live in a village. Right? I'm going to put on my ecologist's hat 
and consider this population in their environment. He wanted to look, as the ecosystem approach dictates, at relationships, right, between actors in an environment. The relationship that he was especially interested in between humans and pigs. Pigs, very, very important in New Guinea, right? For food, for wealth. And what he decided after spending a great deal of time looking into this problem and using his ecological method was that warfare and ritual, as they are expressed among this tribe, are just ways of maintaining the pig population. And especially maintaining the pig population in the right ratio to the human population. This is a, a fascinating, fascinating breakthrough. He said, here's what's going to happen. The pig population increases, right? Of course it does. Malthus says. Okay? It'll continue to grow exponentially. Eventually, you've got too many pigs, and they start to put stresses on your resources. Right? We have limiting factors in the environment. There's not enough food for the pigs. Right? They're starting to damage the land, right? too much erosion, too much waste. And so, you need to slaughter some animals. Or start a war and take someone else's animals. Right? It provides meat, yes. People like to eat, so they get pork for days and days, and ribs and things, I suppose. It also reduces the burden on the land this ritual approach toward warfare and, and pig slaughter. And number three, balances population ratios and it returns the population of pigs and humans back below their carrying capacity. This is a massive, massive uh, break for us in anthropology. This is fascinating. To look at social problems, social phenomena like war, like rituals, religious beliefs around pigs, and to say, I think there's an ecological explanation for this. Right? There are all kinds of studies to be done of the symbolic uh, importance, but to be able to tie it to a specific set of ecological concerns is absolutely fascinating and opens the door for a lot of other research. Let's talk about this guy. Richard Lee, from Canada, works here at the University of Toronto. He's my PhD supervisor. A giant in anthropology for the work that he did in the Kalahari Desert, among the click language speaking Zhuangzi. <laughs> Anybody else do clicks? The slash and the click. There are, there are a few different types of specific clicks in this language. Zhuangzi is one of them. So he goes to the Kalahari Desert and encounters a group of people who are living as hunter gatherers, known by these various names, sometimes just called the Son or the Bushman. These are outdated terms, but convenient ones. At the time, the archaeological record is finally starting to reveal to us that hunting and gathering was a very widespread way of life. Okay? That lots and lots of people all over the world might have been living this way. It's a very popular subsistence strategy, only there's not a lot of people left anymore who hunt and gather full time for a living. We do agriculture and industrial agriculture. So he wants to live with them to learn what their relationship with their environment looks like and what he discovers changes our minds very profoundly. Up until then, people have had this idea that hunting and gathering must be a brutal way of life. Right? This goes all the way back. People remember Thomas Hobbes? Yes? Who was Hobbes? He was a philosopher. Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, they all sort of go together. Again, an Enlightenment character who is trying to imagine the ideal way to govern a society. And so to do this, Hobbes conducts a thought experiment and said, what would people be like before they lived in civilization, before we had society, rules, and manners, and structure? What if you were just totally on your own? in a totally natural state. And he said, that would suck, in short. The, the natural state is terrible. Outside the influence of civilization, the life of man, he says, is, quote, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Richard Lee, not necessarily convinced of this, Hangs out with these people for quite a long time, learns to speak their language, 
conducts piles of very rigorous research about all sorts of different things, but especially their relationship with nature, their relationship with production, right? And he ends up calling them, uh, this is a term that Marshall Solins came up with, the original affluent society. He says, never mind living in Hollywood, right? These people were rich way before we knew what rich was. So one of his key discoveries is that in this society, in order to gather all of the stuff that they need to survive, the average member of this tribe works 15 to 20 hours a week. This is massive. We had imagined that hunter-gatherers must be killing themselves to try to get enough food, right? That it must be terrible. People would be miserable and competitive. And instead, he finds the exact opposite. The huge variety of edible plants, nuts, seeds, fruits that make up their diet, as well as meat, he finds women are actually contributing more to subsistence than men are. On a daily basis, they're gathering more calories for the community than guys are. Right? That the division of labor, highly egalitarian. There's no cash, there's no structure, right? in terms of hierarchies. People share and share alike. And that, in fact, the cultural value that they impose the most is modesty. They have a tradition that's known as insulting the meat. If you and five of your friends go out hunting and you kill a zebra you know, with your poisoned arrow, you come back the next day to pick it up after the zebra's died, after the poison's done its work. Your friends will tease you the entire time that you're walking out to get the zebra. And when they encounter the zebra, they'll say, even if it's fat and muscly and wonderful, they'll say, oh, like if I'd known this thing was so skinny, I wouldn't have walked all the way out here. This is such a drag. Right? Richard published this incredible piece called Christmas in the Kalahari Desert, where he tries to give everyone a Christmas present of a bull. And they tease him endlessly about this bull. Nobody's going to be able to eat off this thing. There's barely enough meat for four people on that. Come on, it's ridiculous. Why do they enforce modesty so strongly? The explanation is ecological. In a hunting and gathering society where you need to distribute right, the food, the meat, it's no good having one person get arrogant. Right? Hunting and gathering are group activities. They live in a rigidly egalitarian society, and so they enforce modesty as a cultural value. So here again, this amazing ability to use an ecological explanation for cultural, social phenomena. And then lastly, we'll talk about Marvin Harris briefly. He starts to introduce an idea known as cultural materialism. That is a move away from sort of structure and superstructure. This is coming to us from Karl Marx. And a focus instead on infrastructure. Briefly, to summarize, this is again a, a, an idea from Karl Marx who we'll talk about in a second. Structure, in Karl Marx's imagination, is the relationships between people. That's structure. Infrastructure is the relationship that you have with your environment. And that can include the built environment. Right? Superstructure is the relationship that you have with ideas. So laws, morals, symbols, religion, even. And Harris said, forget the first one and the third one. Infrastructure is where it's at. That's where you're going to find the interesting stuff. His idea was that all human social life is a response to practical problems. And never mind the abstract and the vague and the symbolic. Find the problem that's being solved. That's where you get your answer, he said. He was especially interested in diet, a thing for food, and he was especially interested in diet and religion. And he said virtually every religion, major religion that we know of, has some rules about what you're allowed to eat. Right? Talk about kosher rules and halal rules. Christians aren't supposed to eat meat on Fridays and all sorts of things like that, right? We have all these prescriptions about what kind of food we're allowed to eat. And he said, there's no religion on earth whose dietary rules leave you with less food. All of those dietary rules are practical, he said. So he took as an example the question of sacred cows in India, which uh, is this fascinating phenomenon, right? Uh, 
among sort of orthodox Hindus in India, cows are not to be killed because they are sacred. And people used to scratch their heads and say, gosh, but killing a cow would give you so much food. And in the context of hunger, why not kill the cow? It seems that adhering to this belief is costing you guys. Harris puts on his ecological hat and says, nope, the cows aren't sacred because they're sacred. The cows are sacred because they are indispensable to the local ecosystem. Think of this as an energy matter problem. Like ecology 101. Cows give you free energy, right, for plowing. So in the absence of mechanized plows, your cow is your labor. You wouldn't eat your cow any more than you'd eat your car. You know, that would just be bad math. And then number two, the matter that they return is more valuable. So milk, lactase persistence being well entrenched in India, milk is a crucial source of food. And a cow will keep giving you milk every day, but it can only give you meat once. Right. Number two, fertilizer. As cows eat grass, they continue to fertilize the field directly behind them. <laughs> uh, and so this is giving you a free source of fertilizer. This is a nice feedback, right? And then lastly, fuel. As it turns out, manure also can burn once it's dried out and makes a handy source of fuel, especially in the absence of lots of firewood. And gathering manure substantially easier than gathering firewood, right? Cow comes to you. <laughs> the, the fuel delivers, right? So Harris gives us this ecological explanation, again, for a, a, a social phenomenon that he thinks you can understand by looking at ecology rather than abstract symbolism. Very interesting. In terms of where we are today with ecological anthropology, uh, there are a few new directions. One example that would be interesting for you guys is to think about William Bally's research on the Kapur. This is a, a tribe living in the Amazon in the rainforest. These are people who name 768 different species of plants, which is absolutely mind-boggling if you imagine that capacity, right, in the absence of computers and books and things, to recognize and name 768 different types of plants. That suggests a relationship with the environment that we can barely understand. And yet, they are under threat, right? These people are starting to have to adapt to logging, to climate change, deforestation, political pressures, and so on. And so increasingly ecological anthropologists are starting in on what we would call radical ecology, kind of militant, action-oriented research. Social justice, essentially. We don't just want to abstractly understand why people in India don't eat cows. We'd like to understand how these people are going to be able to maintain their way of life if the forest around them is being cut down. Now, this is a practical problem, an immediate, urgent problem. So we're focusing increasingly not just on immediate conditions, but global climate change, questions of externalities, right? We said that we could increase the carrying capacity of our field by making the field more efficient, by increasing its productivity. How do we do that? Mostly the Green Revolution was about energy. We just poured buckets of extra energy onto our farm fields. That energy primarily in the form of oil. Right? as fertilizers, as fuel, as artificial lighting, pesticides. When you dump a bunch of oil onto your fields, they grow faster, but that oil has to come from somewhere. Right? And that oil creates exhaust when you burn it, when you process it, creates pollution. So even if that is external to your own culture, it's not external to everyone's. The biosphere is a closed system, essentially, save for sunlight. So we're starting to refine our understanding of how everyone in the world becomes related in these ecological relationships. Thomas Homer Dixon, who we'll be talking about later in the semester, also was a U of T, a political scientist who started to speculate on the relationship between climate resources and war. Remember I said a couple of weeks ago he had this very interesting theory that if you want to explain the Arab Spring, you need to understand grain prices in China. A failed grain crop drove prices up around the world. In places like Canada and the United States, we absorbed that cost. In marginal societies where people were just making enough money to afford their bread or their couscous or their rice, a small increase in grain prices is devastating. 
People started to get upset because they couldn't afford their food and they took to the streets. And then look what happened. Now that's a causal relationship and it's very debatable and a, a complex problem, but this is a really interesting way. This is a very interesting approach to think ecologically about politics. Right. And then lastly, we're starting to develop new ideas about I would say, traditional ecological knowledge. We see that right here in Canada. Did anybody read the news recently about how the ship that Franklin and his expedition were sailing on in the north had been discovered? Yes. Yes, Stephen Harper. Right. Good job, Stephen Harper. How did they find this boat? Did anybody think to ask the Inuit? <laughs> Finally, in 2014, somebody did think to ask the Hey, have you guys seen a boat? And they said, yeah, of course. <laughs> It's right over there. It's been there the whole time. You, you could have asked, right? And we were using satellites. Oh, God, right? So Canada struggles with this problem of traditional ecological knowledge and also traditional land rights. Okay? We still have a reserve system in Canada, which is unusual in a, lot of the, in a lot of the world. But we are trying to balance this idea that perhaps indigenous peoples should have some sort of different relationship with the land. Increasingly, anthropologists are the people who are working at the forefront of this kind of stuff. And then lastly, spiritual ecology. We talked about Rappaport and New Guinea thinking about religion as an ecological phenomenon. The same can be said about Lansing and Bali, who is interested in how ritual priests in Bali control the irrigation of rice fields. And so if you want to talk about the Arab Spring being related to grain prices in China, or rice prices in Indonesia, your first call is the priest and not the farmer. Fascinating stuff. So this is where we are today when anthropologists start thinking about the relationship with people and their environments. All right? Now let's talk about some new developments and some old problems. First, the question of epigenetics. I'm so excited to talk about this. This is fascinating. And you guys are so lucky to be in university right now at, at the cusp of a really exciting time. Number two, we'll talk about the question of social evolution. People have tried to apply Darwin's ideas to all kinds of things. We spoke earlier about this kind of ladder of development, about the idea that people who live in Paris must be the most evolved people in the world because they look and act and think the way they do. So how has that concept been used and misused over time? The natural conclusion of some of those social evolutionary theories is often racism and the misuse of some of these concepts about evolution. And then we'll end with a quick discussion of determinism, what exactly that is and, and why it applies. First, epigenetics. Anyone here into bees? <laughs> right. No, it's not a, a hobby that a lot of people have. So in the middle, this is a queen bee, right? And she is surrounded by her drones. We're comfortable with that? There's one queen in the hive, and then she has all of these hundreds of other bees that sort of work for her, right, gathering honey and so on. It was very recently that a handful of biologists made a discovery that threw a lot of people for a loop and changed what we think about genetics. So we've been able to sequence the genome for the honeybee. And this is nice. It's really useful to have, and we can now do all sorts of interesting research on it. Turns out that a queen bee is genetically identical to worker bees. Identical. But she's fertile. None of the rest are. And she can live for years and years. Right? Worker bees are sterile and they only live for a few weeks. How can these two things be the exact same organism? The difference, turns out, seems to be diet. Queen bees eat what's called royal jelly. It's royal because the queens eat it. You can buy royal jelly in health food stores, right? Yeah. It's just a product that bees make, uh, yeah, along with honey and so on. Eating royal jelly appears to modify a bee larvae's DNA so that the activity of the gene that is coding for DNA methyltransferase, don't worry about that, is suppressed. We'll talk about this mechanism in a second. So if this gene, if this one specific gene is active, the bee turns into a worker. If the gene is still present but just turned off, you become a queen. We can do this experimentally now without even having to eat royal jelly. At the genetic level, you can just use a tiny little needle and sort of poke that one single receptor on the gene to turn it off, 
And now you can make queens like you can make, uh, I don't know what, sandwiches. Yes. So let's talk about this. This, this is endlessly fascinating. <laughs> so we have a handful of different uh, mechanisms in place. But what it looks like is the food that this queen eats activates a gene uh, by switching its expression off, which influences not just her size and shape, but also her lifespan, her behavior. Right? This is social organization. Right? The only piece of hierarchy the bees have is that there's a queen and a bunch of workers. And it turns out that this entire social hierarchy in the hive is determined by turning off the expression of a single gene. Not deleting that gene, right? It's still present, it's just deciding whether or not it's going to turn on like a light bulb. This is really radical. So then the question becomes, what's going on here? It turns out, this is epigenetics. Epi means outside of, above, around. So in other words, epigenetics is something more than genetics. It's different from genetics. Genetics is based on the gene itself. Remember we talked about genotype? The hereditary potential of an organism, right? And genetics is about your DNA sequence. Epigenetics is the study of changes in your gene expression not the structure, but the gene expression, a.k.a. your phenotype, right, that are not caused by changes in the DNA sequence. So the DNA sequence itself stays the same. The structure of that genome is unchanged. All that changes is that one or two of the elements of that gene are turned off or turned on, just like a light bulb. You can express or not express. Certain base pairs in the DNA, right, that structure, the DNA structure remains unchanged, but certain base pairs can be activated or inactivated. There are a few processes by which this happens, DNA methylation, histone modification, <laughs> or RNA silencing. Don't worry about those. I'm, I'm anxious to even teach you guys this because the field is changing very fast. But, in other words, experiences and environmental stresses can actually change the way your DNA works without changing the DNA itself. And then, and this is where this gets really interesting, those changes can be passed on to your offspring. So, let's illustrate this with an example. Has anybody heard of the Dutch hunger? <laughs> Good. All right. History students will have heard of this. Towards the end of World War II, Holland was occupied mainly by the Germans, right? The Nazi occupying army. During the winter of 1944, food was very, very scarce. Uh, the Germans had blockaded things, right? The Allies weren't able to get in tons of food. Uh, and because of the fact that the Germans had started to lose ground on several fronts, I mean, by 44, the war's nearly over, right? The supply lines into Amsterdam, into Holland, to bring in food are dwindling. So, it was also a particularly bad winter. People start dying off. About 4.5 million Dutch people are affected by hunger during this, this winter, and about 22,000 of them die. The rationing was extreme. So people were surviving at first uh, on 1,000 calories a day, by the end, by February of 1945, the ration was down to 580 kilocalories per day. It's starvation rations. This is a tiny amount of food, right? A quarter, maybe, or, or a, even a fifth of the daily requirements for an adult. Now, the fact that this is happening in Holland is important, interesting to us as researchers. Holland is a first world country, right? That keeps good records. All of these people who are living during the Dutch hunger have medical files, they go to the doctor, they have ID cards, right? We know when, exactly when they were born, their height and weight. And so now we have a cohort of people who have survived extreme hunger. Repeating these studies in other places is difficult because there's chronic hunger in some parts of the world. And then you can't isolate a single uh, famine event. If you live in a place where famine happens every three years or something. 
So the Dutch hunger has become this fascinating research problem because we have such wonderful data about it. Right? And we have this nice, tidy sort of cohort of people who all experienced this same starvation across the winter of 1944-45. So, University of Amsterdam and Southampton University started sort of looking into this and they found that children whose mothers were pregnant during the famine. Okay, so if you were in utero in the winter of 44, then when you grow up, you're going to be smaller than other people, be shorter than average. That doesn't seem too surprising, does it? I mean, you're nutritionally starved. That sounds like a developmental adaptation to me, right? A developmental adjustment, sorry. Uh, low calorie, so you want to be lower stature in order to reduce your adult calorie load, and so this is an adjustment. We also found that people who were in utero during the Dutch hunger were more likely to have bad health, uh, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, even maybe mental illness like schizophrenia. What really blows our minds, what we're still trying to, to come to terms with, is the fact that the children of those children are also shorter than average. Now I want you to put on your Darwin hat, your Mendel hat for a moment, and try to understand this. Remember, these children are in utero, they're already conceived. You might be six months old or something, a second trimester fetus, when your mom becomes quite hungry, not enough food. By then, you're already conceived, right? Your genes are set. You've inherited everything that you're going to inherit from your mom and dad at this point, genetically. So why should your mom's grandchildren be short? Because, your, because their grandmother didn't get enough food to eat while their parent you know, was in utero. So what it seems is that that experience of starvation that environmental stress can cause epigenetic changes. That it can silence or activate certain base pairs of the genetic structure, of the DNA, and that those changes can last. We used to think that everything you got, everything that was your genotype, that you would pass on to your children, you got from your parents, right? It turns out increasingly that maybe phenotype can be inherited too. And that your experiences, even after you're born, as an adult, your experiences can have ramifications for your gene and for your children. You're asking about time, when does this have to happen? What's interesting, it appears that it doesn't have to happen in utero. And that in fact, Epigenetic phenomena, silencing or activating of base pairs, increases as we get older. We would call this a sort of time-sensitive drift. The older you get, the more likely it is for certain base pairs to sort of get switched on, switched off, because you're accumulating more experiences. This is starting to ask us some mind-bending questions. What aspects of your behavior today are going to influence the health and well-being of your grandchildren? Can exposure to environmental pollution maybe harm your grandchildren? Smoking cigarettes, exercising, experiencing chronic stress. These are fascinating questions. And these will shape everything that comes next, I think. We are just beginning to understand this. Yes. Right, yeah, was there, a, was there a social selective pressure? The question was, did, did this study select for the height of the spouse uh, of the child in question? Yes, it did. So even given the controls and, and controlling for things like social selection, the grandchildren of Dutch hunger uh, pregnant women were still shorter than expected, right? Given the, what we would anticipate from their genotype, they expressed a phenotype that was too short even though Holland, on average, is the tallest country in the world. Right. Rich diet, lots and lots of milk and cheese and stuff when you're very young in Holland. 
So, this seems to be persistent. When we do mouse studies, we're finding that you can make epigenetic changes last for four generations. So increasingly we are learning it's not just about the DNA. This is exciting for us as anthropologists. It turns out the environment must matter too. And you can actually inherit your grandparents' life in genetic ways. Yes? So is only the first generation that expresses the difference epigenetic or are every single generation after the first generation still epigenetic? Yeah, so the question is, uh, is it only the first generation? So the children that were born right, during the hunger, are they the only ones? Uh, as we said, in mice, and most of the research right now is happening in mice, we can push it out to four generations that these epigenetic changes will last. So is the structure still the same as the, the grandparents, but it's unexpressed, or is it Correct. a different genetic No, the genetic structure is unchanged. This is what's impressive, right? So you, for instance, having blue eyes instead of green eyes, we assume that that's an actual genetic change. We could compare your genes with your dad's and find that they are different. What we're finding now is that even if you inherit identical genes from your father in certain areas, we can turn those genes on and off. So this is not about deleting or changing the genes, rather just flipping the light switch. Finding a base pair that controls something and turning it on or off. As we say, there's a few different mechanisms through which this can happen. And we're just beginning to understand it. Yes? How about sickle cell anemia? You're going to have to wait until November. <laughs> All right. But that is a brilliant question. Yes. <laughs> All right. Let's end this up. Social evolution. This idea about evolution, and I, I hate to move on from epigenetics. It's just so fascinating. But this is important, too. We've used some of our ideas of evolution to consider social and cultural notions of progress. We start thinking that if animals evolve, then so too must human societies. These ideas have been used and misused in different ways over time. We talked about Franz Boas earlier. He was really key in rejecting some of these ideas. Uh, we'll start with our friend Karl Marx. A lot of great beards in today's presentation. A lot of old white guys with big beards. Uh, Marx begins with Friedrich Engels. He borrows his quote that says that all human history is the history of class struggle. If you want to understand human beings and how they've changed and whatever, all you need to understand is that the proletariat, the, the working class, are fighting against the bourgeoisie, the upper class, who control the resources. So if you want, you want your theory of human history, that's it in one sentence. Now. Marx had the idea that all societies would move from what he called tribal or primitive communism. And this is where Richard Lee's studies often got co-opted you know, and borrowed by communists or people interested in Marx's ideas because among the hunter-gatherers of the Kalahari Desert, the San, they appear essentially to be communist. They have no money. They share what they have. This is a communist society. Marx said eventually you move from primitive communism into slavery, into uh, feudalism, and then eventually you arrive at capitalism, which is where we are today. But he said capitalism is not the end. It's just a temporary stage and a bad one. He said where we're going is to arrive at perfect communism, not sort of the primitive version, but an advanced, ideal form of communism. He said we'll be done, we'll be at the top of the ladder when we live in a cashless, propertyless, egalitarian society. Right? So he saw society as this sort of piece of progress, and that if you want to understand the human environment interaction, never mind the environment. It's the economy, stupid. Right? That was Marx in a nutshell. Okay? And his ideas, as we say, they find some resonance, especially in hunter-gatherer studies of subsistence. James Fraser, bearded, slightly more tidily bearded, kind of a Van Dyke, I guess we'd say. He was British interested in mythology and in the history of knowledge, theories of knowledge, and wrote a book called The Golden Bough in 1890 that was a huge bestseller, very influential. The idea of The Golden Bough was that he wanted to look critically at all religions and all forms of knowledge 
and decide how knowledge changed over time in different societies. This was controversial at the time because he included Christianity in the mix and he was living in England, right? And he wrote this in 1890, the time when the church was still very much in control. And he decided to think critically, think empirically about Christianity as well. A lot of people were offended by that. It's all well and good to talk about other religions, you know, scientifically, but come on, Christianity is different from that. Fraser's idea was that societies progress from magic to religion to science. So, unsurprisingly, given the track record of the Greeks, the Romans, Enlightenment Europeans, who do you suppose he figured was at the top of the developmental ladder? People who looked exactly like him, <laughs> right? That progress is the, the history of everybody else in the world trying to eventually end up looking like England in the 1890s. <laughs> the scientific revolution, here we are on top. And eventually those other cultures will just evolve like we did. Best of luck everyone else, right? And then the last person I'll talk about is Francis Fukuyama. He's still around. No beard that I know of. Has been publishing quite recently. Still active. He wrote an essay that turned into a book some years ago, became very influential, and that book was called The End of History. And Fukuyama's argument in The End of History was that we're at the end of history. This is it now. Doesn't mean that things are going to stop happening. It just means that Fukuyama considers history to be a story of progress, kind of like Karl Marx where civilizations are evolving to better and better forms of government. Different and more different and more different forms of social organization. Until they arrive, he says, at which form? The Western liberal market democracy. <laughs> so that's the one, essentially. If you get a government that looks roughly like the United States or Canada, you're there. You've hit the top and there's nowhere left to go. So the old story of wars, of exploration and conquest, conflict, uh, that just won't apply anymore because now we've all arrived at the end of history. Eventually, everyone on Earth will just become a liberal democracy with a capitalist open market like ours and history will be finished. Again, notions of evolution, right? Thinking that this is a straight story of progress. We see some of these leftovers of ethnocentrism, right? The idea that the ego is the yardstick that you measure things against. When Fukuyama talks about everybody wanting to arrive at this stage of liberal democracy, I think, man, based on having been to the Kalahari with Professor Lee, I would much rather live like those people do. 20 hours a week? That sounds nice, right? <laughs> Getting along with your neighbors, <laughs> taking it easy, eating a healthy diet. I mean, one of the things that Lee finds in the Kalahari, no cavities, right? No dentists, no cavities, right? Virtually no chronic disease. You have 70, 80-year-old men out trotting around. Now, they also lack for things like mother and child health of the sort that we have. Modern delivery is really good. It's worth having. Reduces infant mortality and maternal mortality quite a lot. Ambulance services, you know, it's good to have someone set your arm when you fall and break it, right? But along with the good, we've taken up a lot of bad, I think, right? That we will talk about at much length as this course goes on. But there is this idea that the self is in the middle and that everything else is just trying to become more like you, and until it does, it's imperfect, right? It's not hard to see where this goes, right? I think I would rather reuse Lamarck here instead of Darwin. I think if culture evolves at all, it does so in the Lamarckian way. I think culture stretches its neck up but I don't think it mutates randomly. When it comes to culture, we don't throw those 12 eggs against the wall and see which one is best. If anything, humans have a huge capacity to be totally irrational, right? Nor does culture randomly mutate. I think if you want to imagine cultural evolution as a phenomenon, which I think is, is controversial to begin with, then I think Lamarck is uh, a good helmet but a lousy bicycle, whereas Darwin, not so useful at all. Now, when Darwin gets applied to some of these problems, it's not hard to see where they go. 
This is a picture that was taken in 1906. It's really not that long ago, right? And this picture was taken in New York City. People who were living 100 years ago in New York lived lives that would be modern, recognizably modern to a lot of you, right? Nobody was flying to the moon quite yet. But we had a lot of the accoutrements of modern day life by then. This is a picture of a man named Ota Benga, who was a member of the Mbuti uh, Pygmies from what is now the Congo. He was picked up uh, by an explorer, an American explorer, who bought him from a slave trader to, to free him from slavery, and then brought him back to the United States. First, uh, he was displayed at an anthropological exhibit in St. Louis in 1904, and then later at a zoo, a human zoo in New York City, in the Bronx, in 1906. It's a fascinating story, his life story. It's been pieced together, some interesting archival work on it. If somebody wants to look into that, I think it'd be a fascinating quick talk to give us next week. It's not hard to see how Darwin's theories start getting applied to notions of cultural adaptation. The people at the top, or the people at the center, the ego, start to imagine that they are the most highly evolved, right? the superior example of development, and that you can end up using good ideas. Right? We still think Darwin was onto something. He's still useful today. Even in the face of epigenetics and so on, Darwin still matters. He was right. But when we apply his ideas to things like this, they get corrupted. They're poor tools for understanding these problems. And this, unfortunately, is a legacy that anthropology still carries, right? So if you're going to be studying in this field, we still sort of have this in our background, you know? Something that we need to come to terms with and something that we need to still work to avoid and reject. So, this lastly brings us to the topic of determinism. Two types, environmental and cultural. Determinism is a theory that gives one factor in a system dominance. In other words, you look at a system and say, ah, this is the factor which determines the processes and outcomes of this system. In other words, environmental determinism looks at an ecosystem and says, the way that you explain what's here is by understanding the environment. Culture doesn't matter. Culture is secondary. What counts is the environment. Great example of this, Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond. Has anybody read that book? I'm seeing some nodding. Can anybody give us uh, Diamond's argument in sort of 10 words or less? Diamond sets out to explain how come across a few centuries ago, several centuries ago, how come Europe did so well, right? Why did Western Europeans expand successfully, take over, right, become economically, politically dominant? And his theory is the environment did it. The reason that one area is more developed than another is because they have better plants, their animals are easier to domesticate, they have rivers that are easier to sail up and down so you can have trade, you can develop surplus, you can deliver value and so on. So Diamond gives us a classic environmental determinism argument. Don't worry about culture, it's the environment that does it, right? That's not to say that the argument is wrong, just that you need to recognize which tools are being used to solve this problem. And if you're reading Diamond's book, it's important to put on your cultural anthropologist's hat and say, hang on a second, culture matters. The opposite would be cultural determinism that says the environment doesn't matter. Nature is just the stuff that you see through the window. In a sense, Karl Marx is a cultural determinist, right? The environment itself, who cares? It's the economy, stupid, right? That's Karl Marx. What matters is the relationship between the workers in this environment, the antagonism between those who have a lot and those who don't, right? That's how you understand human history. That's how you understand this environment. Fortunately, we're the smart ones here in this room. As ecological anthropologists, we reject both of these forms of determinism and strike a happy balance, right? It's the environment and culture. It's the interplay between them, our dual inheritance, 
that's what makes us the way we are today, right? Don't you all feel smugly superior now <laughs> to people like Karl Marx and Jared Diamond with all their bad ideas? If only they had thought to ask us first, right? Could have done so much better. So, the reading. We have a couple of minutes. Jamaican sprinters, why do they run so fast? Jamaica's a small country. There's three of them in an Olympic final. I mean, just by population, if, if sprinting talent were randomly distributed, you would expect a quarter of that race, the third of that, that final, to be India-China, right? 2.5 billion, I think, people between those two countries. So, you guys are the cultural anthropologists. You've done the reading. How come Jamaicans run so fast? Yes. Yeah, a sort of, what kind of argument is that? It's kind of an environment. The, the suggestion was, you know, one of the things the author said was that the best sprinters tend to come from the east of Jamaica, where the soil is very rich in aluminum. Uh, the presence of this aluminum might actually help to have an epigenetic effect, right, to help to activate a gene expression that regulates cardiac muscle growth or muscle growth generally. Yeah. Are you convinced? Yeah. Pro same province. Okay. So we would need to see like a soil map or something to see do these do these places really share the same soil? Fascinating. Do you think that's it? Does anybody else? Does anybody not buy the argument? Yeah. What do you think? Right. Mm -hmm. So, like, like they're sort of the same province, but if they're actually started out from the eastern part of the country. Well, you don't have to be born with an epigenetic effect. Remember, you can acquire it later in your life. Yeah. So maybe, you know, you arrive in that neighborhood as a young kid. You start eating lots of fruit and vegetables that's grown in the soil. You have a high aluminum diet. That might be enough to cause an epigenetic effect. So what I'm saying, they don't have to be born in the eastern part or live in the eastern part. Okay. Even if four generations back. Maybe their grandparents or something were there and they still carry the legacy of that later. Interesting, yeah. So could we get birth records for all of their ancestors and stuff? And I think there was a mention of that in the article. Somebody said, well, I'm not from there, but my grandmother was or my mother was or something. Huh. Look, there's also a historical selective pressure at play here, right? The slave trade. And this was another one of the arguments that essentially this was a massive artificial evolutionary bottleneck that people went to West Africa, took the strongest, fittest people that they could, and then stuck them in a boat, essentially starved them, abused them until many of those people would die, and the ones who survived arrived in the New World, either the Caribbean or the United States. And so this essentially had the effect of being like a giant predator being like a giant famine or something. It was a selective pressure that winnowed out people who were less healthy, less robust, or whatever. And so maybe generations ago, the slave trade ended up selecting for people from West Africa who had certain of these qualities that end up coincidentally making you good at sprinting, right? Muscular development, robust health, bone structure, who knows? That's kind of a compelling argument. I find that interesting. The one that wasn't touched was culture. I think in Canada, if you grow up as a kid who has like really great anaerobic capacity, a lot of fast twitch muscle, you don't sprint, you play hockey, right? Jamaican kids grow up wanting to be Usain Bolt. And if they go and do well at sprinting, their parents are proud of them. If you win the 100 meter dash, you know, at high school in Canada, your parents are sort of like, hey, hey good for you, you know? I think maybe we underestimate culture in that article, but I think it's a great example of how you guys could write your final papers. Considering a few different factors and a specific problem. So, biology, the environment, and culture, they all interact. And the more we learn, the less we know. Exciting times to be you guys. This is changing so fast. One thing that does seem certain, anthropologists are getting it right. 
Hey, keep involving culture and the environment together. Consider genetics and epigenetics. Consider the influence of structure on how humans act, how we